Well, thank you for sticking with us this afternoon. Um, I know you're not here for me, so I'll keep my remarks short. Um, um, you know, this morning when we presented, um, I was able to share good news with you that, you know, we have the momentum, that we're seeing progress, that we are winning this generation uh, when it comes to the issue of abortion, when it comes to life. We see this fact reflected in uh, polling numbers. We were just talking about some good polling numbers, some polling that Students for Life did this, this spring, found that only 7% only 7% of millennials uh, supported the Democratic National Committee's platform of abortion of all nine months for whatever reason and taxpayer funded. Uh, we're seeing this reflected just in the growth of you know, my own organization, Students for Life, in 13 years of, of taking this small startup group and now 1,200 groups in all 50 states, training 75,000 young people, and it's certainly not because of me, but there, there's this momentum out there. You see it in you know, the news media, the narratives, how they're covering our issue. You know, the brand of our pro-life movement has changed and is changing to young, hip, and joy-filled. You know, anytime there's an article about abortion in a regional or a city newspaper, you see a young woman holding an I am the pro-life generation sign. That is completely different from 15 years ago. So we have momentum. There is a lot of great news that we can share with you today and we hope to share with you. Um, but I think there's also some concerning news uh, that we talk a lot about and we've talked a lot in the lunches and dinners so far here at Napa. We're talking about millennials, young people, Generation Z, um, because there's a lot of confusion. Uh, they're being purposely confused by the left through the indoctrination they receive in the school system. Um, it has actually been, you know, it's considered now harmful, judgmental for someone to choose a side, to actually pick a side of an issue, to stand up and say, I believe this is right or this is wrong. That's considered harmful and judgmental and you're shaming someone. The middle, uh, the middle has actually become the moral high ground. Students for Life right now, we're doing a $400,000 research project on how to convert mushy middle Millennial women, those women who say, I don't like abortion, I wouldn't have one, but I can't tell somebody else what to do with their body. And one thing that's become very clear just in the first two months of this research project is what we thought, you know, people were, young women were finding themselves in the middle. What we're finding is they're choosing to be in the middle. Um, and we see this on campus all the time. We, we, we see this in the, um, you know, the left's uh, victimhood hierarchy that they have on campuses, that despite you know, the fact that the majority will acknowledge that abortion does kill, that abortion harms, in the hierarchy of victimhood with the left, uh, killing the unborn child that's a necessary and kind of acceptable consequence of securing one's dominion over themselves. And you will have young men and women who will say this to you uh, unashamed, that this is an okay and acceptable consequence of a choice that they are making. Um, some people will say that it's, it's all lost. <laughs> Uh, if you talk to my grandfather, that's certainly what he's going to say when we talk about these issues of millennials and abortion and social issues. I, I don't believe that, and neither does Governor Walker, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We, we can win. You know, I mentioned this this morning. Students for Life is having conversations. This year, we're going to have 250,000 conversations on college and high school campuses. We're going to see an over 50% conversion rate. We are going to change minds. Um, and, and we're going to, it's, we're going to do it through building this movement of using kind of these social justice techniques that we've learned through the civil rights movement, uh, through the anti-slavery movement, how you build momentum, how you show young people that they're not alone, that this is a, a cause worthy of investing their time in, showing them that this is a human rights issue, that, that just how they're opposed to violence and all these other aspects in their lives, this is another act, another form of violence. It's a form of discrimination. Um, but, but we know, you know, the left isn't going to give up. Planned Parenthood, the abortion lobby, knows they're losing. You can see this very clearly in their firing of Leanna Wynn, their president of only eight months, just a week and a half ago. 
firing her because she wasn't militantly pro-abortion enough. She, wa she wanted to take, you know, Planned Parenthood out of politics. And this is where they've decided to fight. And Governor Walker, you're the perfect person to talk about fighting uh, the militant left. Um, you know, they're going after us on social media. We saw the White House just had a social media summit about the suppression of pro-life speech. Uh, anytime I tweet now, no matter what I tweet about, uh, the image is blurred out and says, this may be offensive, click here. Doesn't matter what I tweet, even if it's a picture of my children, uh, that's what Twitter has labeled me as an offensive person. But I guess I am a little offensive sometimes. Uh, you know, they, they want to silence us. They do this on campuses. This is why we work with ADF. We, we have, well, I'm a great client of Alan Sears. We have so many lawsuits. Yes. <laughs> Um, because they've tried to silence it, because they know they're losing, right? They, they want to shut you up. Um, and then they try every tactic they can, whether it's, you know, disavowing your speakers, uh, saying that your club isn't going to get money for an event, telling a Students for Life club, well, you got death threats, so therefore you have to pay for security for yourselves to, you know, save yourselves. When I was on a campus in California not long ago, we had Antifa th calling in death threats. So we had bomb sniffing dogs go into the room and they tried to charge us for that. And said, no, Antifa can pay for the bomb sniffing dogs. Just two months ago, banners of my face were set on fire before I went on campus. So, I mean, you can see that the other side they're afraid. They read the same polls. They see the news articles. Um, they they know they're losing, but we've got to we've got to do more. We, quite frankly, we have to do more, and that's why, Governor Walker, I've asked you to come today because you know every year when I come to Napa, this is my fifth year, my fourth year as a Catholic, by the way, my first time at Napa. I was like the only Protestant here. Um, so every year when I come to Napa, when I when I'm with my fellow legates at the Legatus Summit. The number one thing that I get asked, and even our team members get asked, is, what do I say? You know, what do I say to my grandchild, my child, who has gone away to college, comes back at Thanksgiving, and is totally a different person? You know, their worldview has been challenged. And so I thought today, we can kind of have a discussion about, I think you've, you know, have kind of shown that you've got the, a passion and an interest for young people, and, but you haven't given up on us yet. Uh, so I want to hear from you of what you think we can be doing better and how to have this conversation with young people, what we can be saying, what we should be doing to win them over and to keep them active in their faith, keep them active in their values. So um, the first question I have for you, um, and I'll make these easy questions, I'll try to. Um, what do you think... I can handle tough questions too, so... <laughs> I'm not as hard as a debate stage. Uh, what do you think is our biggest obstacle in winning over this generation? What, what's the biggest obstacle in keeping them active and just bringing them into our fold, into our camp? Yeah, great question. First of all, thanks for your leadership and thanks for your passion. You can tell she's got an incredible amount of passion uh, for our students and our Right to Life movement. And thanks to all of you for joining us, not just for this discussion, but joining us here. Um, I, I think about this, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I've thought about this before, but in the book of Nehemiah, uh, God says to Nehemiah, before he can understand the what, he has to understand the why. Before he can rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, it's not enough just to understand the what, it's why. Why, why did the wall come down? Why did God choose to do that? And I think sometimes, be it in the pro-life movement and other related things, we're so focused on the what, we forget to identify the why. Uh, I, I know for me personally, probably like a lot of people here, uh, my beliefs, not just my belief in the sanctity of life from conception through natural death, uh, but many other similar issues comes out of my parents, uh, my family, my church. Uh, later is, is part of the reason why I'm proud to be helping out with Students Life again is when I went to Marquette University, I was proud to be a part of and then president of Marquette Students for Life long before I was involved in any politics or college Republicans or anything else. Uh, just because that was at the core. I mean, to me, when I look at candidates for any office, I want to know where they stand on the life issue, because to me, if they don't get that right, uh, it's hard to identify anything else that they can stand for that I'm going to trust. Um, you can clap for that. Uh, but but over over time, and, and this is you know, when I was in the legislature and I was a county official and then governor, a lot of times it's really easy to get caught up in the what? This bill, this piece of legislation, this lawsuit, all of which are important, 
but I often tried to sit back and, and remind myself, and I remember one of the times we were debating a, a bill and, and it was about adding, Wisconsin for years has had a, a law that, that prohibits, provides a penalty for abortion to those providing it. Uh, obviously Roe v. Wade, until that's changed, is not uh, fully enforceable, but we were adding another law for because of a, a horrible case where uh, a woman had been abused by her estranged husband and had killed their unborn ch her unborn child, and they weren't able to charge more than just against her. And so the law we had added allowed for two uh, crimes to be charged. And I remember the liberals were, were all aghast. They made all the typical arguments. And I got up and I said, you know, imagine um, a, a man and a woman in a minivan. She's pregnant. They're married. They've got a family. They're driving along. It's a horrible example, but it made my point and said, imagine if a drunk driver slammed into that minivan uh, into the passenger side, severely injured the woman, the, the mother of the child who was there, and in the process uh, killed that unborn child. Because that was what we were debating about. But I said the larger debate, and why I bring this up when talking to young people, and even others for that matter, is, is I use that example and say, uh, it, forget about the law for a minute. Just as someone who might be a friend of that family, what card would you send them? Would you send them a get well card? Or would you send them a sympathy card? Because if you're a friend and they lost their unborn child because someone rammed into the side of their minivan and killed their unborn child through the injuries provided to the mother of that child, I think anyone decent, regardless of where they stand on the spectrum, would send a sympathy card. So if you're sending a sympathy card, you're acknowledging that that's a child. But that's an unborn child, and that there's a reason to grieve for that, whether it was in that horrific example of an accident or whether it's someone going into an abortion clinic and doing essentially the same thing. And so I think sometimes we get so far in these debates and discussions, we get, and the what's important, don't get me wrong, but I think it's really important, particularly with young people, to understand why. Because a lot of times I think, my kids are 25 and soon to be 24, I hear a lot from them and their friends. They feel like they're, they're talked at, not with, right. uh, by people like me and, 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 and the, our generation. I think it's really important to talk with them and to share real examples that have meaning to them that can apply to them. And I know when we do, the optimist in me says they respond. They're not what the media makes them out to be, and we've seen it in the data out there, but we've got to have a conversation, not just talk at them. That's great. And that's exactly what we were talking about earlier, authenticity, right? That is why you met a young voter who was a Bernie voter, yeah. Bernie supporter, and then ended up voting for President Trump and was a fan of yours. Because in all three I wanted the picture with him because I couldn't <laughs> believe it. But, uh, but he was looking, right, he was, yeah. for a lot of people, they're not even necessarily ideological. No. Uh, they're looking for reaction. They want people who are the real deal. They're tired in politics in particular being let down. And so they're looking for people that they think are authentic. Yeah. And, and we can show them the, the, the most authentic thing is what's in your heart. I think deep down, everyone knows how important it is to protect life. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have been pushed into saying, well, I, I might feel that, but I shouldn't tell people that. Mm -hmm. I, I should impose my views on others out there. In our heart of heart, we know that life is important and we should be protecting it. And I think that's really important to get at with young people. That's right. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, as governor of Wisconsin, um, you proved yourself very well as a principal leader who would not back down to the mob. I don't know if you all remember 2012 or 2011. Um, you were unyielding, unafraid, and you stood your ground. What are some of the most impactful things you think that parents and grandparents can say can or do to help the young people in their lives when they go to college when they go to campus for them to be prepared to be unafraid to fight for their faith and their values yeah I, again i think it's real important uh, to to mentor uh, whether it's your kids your grandkids your nieces your nephews uh, whatever family member might be and I, and i think there's a, a yearning out there by a lot of our young people uh, that want that they just again don't want to be talked at they want to be they want to they, they want to learn they want to have understanding but they want to have a conversation uh, they want to know how did you come to the decisions you've made you know sharing your faith sharing your values I think those things are incredibly important mm -hmm. I know not only for my parents in the church but I, I think back you know when I was uh, 12 years old Ronald Reagan first ran for president of the United States and I got to tell you today other than my parents and my immediate family uh, I don't think anyone had a greater influence on me in public service 
uh, than President Reagan, not, not just because I happen to be a conservative and Republican, but because I'm an optimist. Uh, I loved President Reagan's belief in the American people and belief if given the chance they'd get to the, the right conclusion, the right decision. And I think that's incredibly important too, because again, not only do I think a lot of people feel talked at, uh, but but sometimes, and the media piles on this, and I was ha I'm glad to sit in and hear some of the other folks. I, I loved hearing the panel with uh, Jim from Focus on the Family and others, uh, you know, about being happy warriors, about being, you know, we're blessed. I, I, I should say, not just in this movement, but you know, for me, I, I'm blessed every day because I think about, you know, I, I, I wake up and realize I'm a sinner, and it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that I'm saved and able to even do the things I'm able to do. And... And it's just so remarkable to think that God has put us here in a spot to be able to share that message and to share the wonder and the joy that comes from life. And so if we tell that, the media loves, and, and some even in social media love to portray us, and, and they do all the way back, not just today's generation, but I think back to when I was on campus and you know, we were working with a group called Birthright, uh, which helped crisis pregnancies, not only on the Marquette campus, but elsewhere. And it was shocking to people because they thought all we were was holding up protest signs. And, you know, that's important, too, to make your voice be heard. But, but to show that compassion, that, that we're, I mean, truly the, the, the ultimate compassion of standing up for life. And not just the time of birth, but then all the way through, all the things that those of us in the movement and those of us who've had the honor of serving in office try to do, not just to protect life, but to, to, to support that life all the way through till the time when God calls him or her home. Yeah, I'd say a prayer for us because we're going to college campuses this fall to talk about why conservatives care more and to make that case because that needs to be said. Um, we really do need to have this conversation out there. So, and your point about mentorship is right on because we're seeing, you know, often when I speak for Lagos chapters, people say, yeah, 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 we already got the pro-life covered. Talk about millennials. Talk about young people and how to keep, how do we keep, you know, our grandchildren active in their faith? And, you know, in my research, it's been fascinating because for years it was kind of, thought that evangelicals were like leading the cutting edge of young people. They had, and, I, and I'm a convert, so I, I remember this. We had, you know, foosball tables, and we had a rock climbing wall in the church basement, and all these activities, and it was, okay, Catholics just have to step it up, and we have to make, you know, all the young adult ministries more fun. If you're, if you're more fun, you have these big youth groups. But that was really the wrong thinking because what we found was the retention wasn't there, that when everyone turned 18, and this was very, you know, APRO in my, in my little church community, when everyone turned 18, people stopped coming um, because there wasn't relationship. And what they found was the churches, no matter Catholic, evangelical, it was the churches that encouraged mentorship and relationship and got young people having dinner in other people's homes and building relationships with adults who they can trust. Well, and, and a lot of times it's, again, through stories. I mean, the ultimate story teller uh, told parables yeah. um, and mm -hmm. it's a great way to sink in and you know I just did the one about the, the minivan but I think not only on the life issue but sometimes people say you know boy but the college or university my, my son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter goes to is just so far off the deep end and there are so many competing pressures and I, I often I was telling somebody earlier this I use an example of uh, to me when I'm on campus and someone asked me a question between you know on the left or on the right I would say the difference between freedom and socialism is real simple. It's the difference between a taxi and an Uber. Mm -hmm. A taxi is, taxis are in communities that are highly regulated, highly restricted. They limit who can be in. Uh, there's a high fee involved. I, I said that's what happens typically in, in societies where they embrace socialism. They, they say, we want to tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do it, because they put their faith in the government. I said Uber or Lyft is just the opposite. Uber or Lyft says, you know, as long as the, the rider and the, the driver are safe, they don't care whether you drive once a day or 100 times a day. Uh, as long as you're safe, they're fine with that. I said, to me, that's my view, point of view is as long as you don't hurt the health and safety of your neighbor, and obviously it begins and ends with life, mm -hmm. as long as you don't violate the life, something that's not just a theory, something that was written right into the very declaration that created the founding of this country, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It, it started with life. It should always be about life here. Uh, but to me, as long as, as long as you protect that, mm -hmm. then, then I'm fine with you doing your own thing, living your own life. And that's what a lot of people, young people, I think particularly want to do. They, they, want, they want to dream big. They want to be aspirational. They want to be inspired. They want to, but the right to life movement, I think in particular, can do just that. 
That's right, and that's what, how we capitalize, right? Of you can make a change in this movement. You can save lives. You can be a social justice warrior and the ultimate social justice cause for the pre-born. So my last question uh, is more of a personal question just because I'm interested in this, but um, how does your faith influence your public life? You know, do you treat it separately? Um, you know, it, it kind of goes into that question of how you answer those mushy middles on the issue of abortion and gay marriage. Of I personally don't agree, but I don't have the right to tell somebody. You know, that's you know that's my private life. That's my faith, my private life. But publicly, I'm pro-choice or something like that. Yeah, I mean, for me, and, and I've said this before, but I, I start in the day on my knees, and if everything else it begins and ends with prayer and the focus. On, on not just my prayer life, but God's calling through the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to be on the right track. And I don't think you separate that. I, I think not only in public life, I, I can't imagine anyone who's got a, 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 an affirmative relationship with Jesus Christ is going to say, well, I only apply that to my religious life, but I don't apply that to my personal life or my professional life. It's all interconnected, not only in terms of the, in public life, not just does it drive, drive the positions I take and have taken in the past. It's even how I treat people. I mean, you mentioned the protest. At one point, we had uh, 100,000 protesters in and around our state capitol. The, my apologies, the, uh, the Occupy movement didn't start on Wall Street. It started on my street in Madison, Wisconsin, yeah. and eventually went to Wall Street and elsewhere. Uh, but, you know, I, I remember once I was in the thick of it all. My kids were in high school still that first uh, two years I was governor. And uh, as if we didn't have enough chaos, one of my oldest son's uh, classmates' parents had moved away and he wanted to finish his year at that high school, his senior year. And so he asked, my son asked if he could stay with us. And he said, okay, sure. Like, we, like we don't have enough chaos going on already. <laughs> so one fall day, we're out raking leaves in front of our home. We, we had, we'd come home every night from the Capitol about an hour away to, to keep my kids in school, to keep with their friends. And we're raking leaves, and a car comes by. We're in a busy street, and window rose down. Out comes a hand. Guy gives me a one-finger salute. And... And uh, Gavin, this kid with me, goes, Mr. Walker, how do you put up with that? I said, well, you know, you just pray about it, stay positive. I said, sooner or later, you know, God will take care of all these things. You just never know the time or the place. And I, th I thought to myself, well, that was pretty good advice, but, but how am I going to show this? So I went back to raking, and literally not less than five minutes go by, and I hear now two cars honking. I'm thinking, oh, man, I should have raked at night. Uh, <laughs> what am I doing here? And, and these two cars come by, they're both honking, windows go down, both drivers send their hands out, and I thought, oh, here it goes again. Both give me a thumbs up. And, and Mr. <laughs> and, and Gavin says to me, Mr. Walker, did you know that was going to happen? Uh, and I didn't, but it was just a great, you know, I, I thank God for it because it was a great reminder, not only to Gavin, but to me, that if you, it's not just in the actions that you take or the beliefs that you, or the positions that you take, it's in how you treat people. Uh, and, and I think sometimes the greatest ministry we can have is not only standing up for the right thing, but how we go about doing that. That, that oftentimes, um, my mother's quiet as a church mouth, but I think she has some of the most positive impact on people uh, because she sends notes and she gives them cookies and she does all sorts of wonderful things for shut-ins. And most people don't ever know about it, but she has such an influence on people's lives for the positive, And she's such a reflection of Christ in her life. And I, and I think that certainly for me is something that, again, my parents and people in my church and others were about. But I also think that's important back to what you're talking about with millennials and having that influence. If you've got kids or grandkids or other family members, it's, it's going out and sharing why this is so important to you. Uh, not just the life movement, but why our faith, putting our faith in action. It's not enough just to believe these things. It's having the courage to act on that. And, and i got to tell you, when it happens, somebody here today came in and, and said they were praying for me. And I, I told Mike Pence this a couple of years ago. He's a good, dear friend. said when he was first asked to be the running mate with the president, said he was going, I think, to Iowa the next day. He said, when you do that, reach out and touch some people when they tell you. I found that to sustain me during the height of the protest. I'd come to a factory. I, I'd be at a school. I'd be wherever at, and somebody would say, I'm praying for you. And I realized after the first few times, nobody tells you that if they don't mean it. They might be fibbing if they say I voted for you or, or that I support you, but nobody looks you in the face and says, I pray, you know, I pray for you. 
and, and so I told Mike this. I said, I touch people. And so if, if anybody tells me later, don't feel weird when I touch your elbow or hand or whatever. But I do that because it, I think back into the Bible when, when Christ was walking through the courtyard and the woman who had been unclean for 12 years reached out and touched, not even just his cloak, but the, but the actual end of the cloak. And Jesus turned around and knew instantaneously that someone had touched him. And I just thought, boy, that's such a vivid reminder of the power of prayer. In her case, she was, she was praying. She was there because she knew. Her, her, her belief ultimately healed her because she knew that Christ was the Messiah, that, that, he, uh, that he could heal her. And, and so I just think it's so powerful when we, we share our faith, when we share the power of God in our lives, whether it's fighting for, for life, whether it's fighting to keep families intact and support strong and healthy families going forward. I think in all these things, um, in this world today, I think with anybody, I think it's just millennials, but I think particularly with youth on our campuses and those young professionals and those just coming through our high schools and junior highs, the more we can authentically share our faith and, and tell why that drives our decisions, the more success we're going to have in the movement. Yeah, it's, it's really as simple as that. It's sharing your faith, sharing your values. Don't be afraid to have that conversation, even when it's an uncomfortable conversation. I recently told my oldest son about abortion. Uh, and he's 10 years old. He's heard about it, obviously, a lot. He's seen me on TV talk about it. And it was, it was a difficult conversation. But I shared with him. I showed him what happens. Not, you know, it was a 10-year-old appropriate way. Um, but he'll never forget that. And he knows what's on my heart. He knows why we fight against this, right? Well, and think about it, too. I mean, we mentioned this data. Um, it's interesting. When you think we should almost give an award to the, the governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam. Yes. Because I don't know that any other politician this year has done more to advance the pro-life movement than him through his... He started me like 20 new students for life groups Absolutely. overnight. But think it right, because when the polls earlier this year, you saw the Knights of Columbus sponsored uh, Marcus poll showed a 20 point movement among, among self identified Democrats. And in their poll, it went from, I think it was the beginning of the year, where 65% supported legalized abortion to less than 50% and, and leveled the playing field out there when people started to hear, you know, Governor Northam and others talking about what actually happened. The idea that, you know, he, remember when he said, you know, the, the, the child is delivered, the child is held, made comfortable, I mean, and then they decide whether they keep the child or not. I, I was saying the other day, I, I um, t almost got bumped off of Twitter, so I can appreciate what you said. <laughs> I, I took a new story in Milwaukee. It's a horrific story of a couple that had a newborn child, brought the child home, and strangled the child. Allegedly, I guess I have to say till they're charged, but um, horrible, right? So I tweeted... I retweeted that story and said, this is horrible, but how is it any different than what Ralph Northam talked about earlier this year? The only difference is the few hours between the time that the child went home in the case I was tweeting about versus the example Ralph Northam gave of the child being at the hospital, being born, and then they decide whether or not they're going to kill that in that child's life. To me, I said it's not live birth abortion, it's not infanticide. It's simply murder, and it's murder whether it's in the hospital or the clinic or whether it's at home a couple hours later, and the more people understand that and understand it's not enough to just say, I don't personally believe with it. Yeah. That, that's like saying, I don't personally believe that that family shouldn't have strangled that child, but I'm not going to tell them what to do. That is wrong in a just society. It's just as wrong when it's committed in a clinic or a hospital or anywhere else. All right, so wrap it up. we got to go. We have a reception right at the Vineyard Terrace uh, right now. Um, so join us. We'll make our way over there. But a Spitzer summary, I'm going to say it real fast, is don't be afraid to talk about the hard issues. Have the awkward conversations because if you don't talk to your young people about your faith, your values, somebody else is going to do it and you're not going to like what they have to say. So be courageous. Show the truth. We know we have the truth. Shine that light into the darkness, and the darkness will flee. Thank Amen. you.